Thank you all for joining us tonight. And a special welcome to all of those joining us online. Um, we have provided for you tonight this Sacred Heart of Jesus devotion uh, handout. There's also a place for notes. This is accessible online. So if you're watching online, you should be able to you should be able to access this and you can certainly print it and, and reproduce it as needed. My name is Chris DeBio. I'm here on the formation team and tonight we're joined by our new permanent deacon, Deacon Jules Bro. And so we're so happy to have him here with us tonight and he will lead us in our opening prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. You can all follow along on your cards. Oh yes, it's on your prayer cards. O sacred heart of Jesus, filled with infinite love, broken by our ingratitude and pierced by our sins, yet loving us still, accept the consecration we make to you of all that we are and all that we have. Take every faculty of our souls and bodies only day by day draw us nearer and nearer to your sacred heart and there as we shall hear the lesson teach us your holy way in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit amen amen thank you deacon jules before we get started can you just give us like a one or two minute recap of like who you are where you're from who's your mama you know give us all those details yeah sure uh Deacon Jules Bro, uh, originally, I'm going to say this publicly, originally from Kaplan, uh, back where I grew up, um, married to my absolutely beautiful wife, Sabrina. We have five children, 15, 13, 10, 8, and 4. Yep, got it. <clears throat> and um, we were originally assigned to St. Alphonse's uh, in Maurice and Our Lady of Perpetual Help in Leroy. I was ordained in 2023, um, and so I've been a deacon for a year and a half, and uh, I currently hold the title of the baby deacon in the diocese. Uh, I was only 14 days old enough to be, to be ordained, so um, we are very, very excited to be members of the Sacred Heart family and uh, look forward to seeing uh, what God has in store for us as we serve the beautiful people over here. Well, welcome, and thank you so much for agreeing to be with us here tonight for our formation night. As most of you know, our formation nights are held three to four times a year to provide catechetical formation and to get, be like a springboard for us to go deeper into our faith. And so we hope that you will leave here tonight. We do have a lot of resources that we're going to mention tonight. You can take notes. I'll help you with spelling, and I'll be available after to help you as well. But um, please use the links provided um, on this to access additional information because the goal is for us to just give you a little primer so that you can continue to grow in your faith um, and to continue to ask questions seeking the truth. So welcome. Okay, so we're going to get started. Tonight we're going to be talking about the Sacred Heart of Jesus and the devotion to Sacred Heart and what does that mean. So let's start with a, an easy one for you to get you going. What is a devotion? A devotion. So let's think about us humans and our humanity, right? We are definitely creatures of habit. And we pretty much always, once we have a routine in our life, we stick to it. One of the hardest routines for us to actually break is that of our breakfast routine. Um, so if you have a normal coffee shop that you usually go to, that's going to be the one you go to. Well, a devotion is something that we add as a routine, okay? It's, it's a part of our routine that we add into our life. And uh, devotion typically uh, is referred to an external type of something that we add into our religious practices um, that help deepen our relationship with God and bring us closer to him and to the mysteries of our faith. Very good. Okay, so why do Catholics, like why do we have so many devotions? And give us some examples and, and let us kind of understand devotions in the Catholic tradition. Sure. In the Catholic tradition, um, so those devotions, right, are they, they're those habitual things that we, that we do. Uh, it's important to know that a devotion is completely voluntary. It's, it's something that we choose to pick up. It's something that we want to devote to because maybe we have a certain calling towards a certain thing. We have an affinity for something. Uh, some examples of devotions uh, would be the rosary. 
Praying our rosary regularly um, is definitely a devotion. It's something, it's actually one of my favorites, um, is, is praying the rosary, which helps us to meditate on the mysteries of Christ through his life, death, his resurrection, um, and also on Mary's role in salvation, um, honoring her as our mother. Another devotion um, that you may see may be prayers to certain saints, right? You pick your patron saint and you're asking for their intercession on a regular basis. That's a devotion that you may have. Another uh, popular one would be the Divine Mercy, a devotion to the Divine Mercy, especially the Divine Mercy Chaplet. That devotion came about uh, from Sister Faustina out in Poland. Uh, if you heard me preach uh, last Sunday, I talked a little bit about her. Um, and then lastly, uh, just another example, there's many, many examples of different devotions, is going to be the one that we're going to focus on tonight, which is that of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Thank you. So tell us a little bit about the history of the devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. Yeah, so like a lot of our faith uh, is rooted in tradition, right? It's rooted, there's a lot of things that happen that aren't necessarily as well documented. Um, but there are some things that are extremely well documented. The devotion to the Sacred Heart is pretty ancient, and there's a lot of um, older fathers that have spoken about it, but it was really uh, St. Margaret Mary uh, in the late 1600s that uh, brought the devotion forward and really um, worked to help spreading the devotion to the Sacred Heart. I looked up her name today. Yes. I looked up how to pronounce her last name okay. so I would say it properly. Go for it. Sister Margaret Mary Alacoque. 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 Okay. Okay. So um, let's talk about the visions. Let's talk about, well, first let's go back. I want to I wanna talk really quickly about um, the difference between regular devotions, like he mentioned, like novenas and rosaries and the devotion to the Sacred Heart, because the devotion to the Sacred Heart, according to Hariatus Aquas, which is the 1956 encyclical by Pope Pius XII, um, he said that the devotion to the Sacred Heart is not like ordinary devotions, and this is actually a devotion that all Catholics should participate in. So. Um, I thought how beautiful that we are members of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And so tonight our our goal is to talk about why this devotion is important, to help expose you to the ways you can honor the devotion, but then really encourage all of us when we leave to pray about taking on the devotion to the Sacred Heart as something that we, we, we do in our daily lives. And the reason is, this encyclical, and an encyclical is a papal letter, so it's a letter written to all the bishops that gives us dogma, it gives us doctrine, it gives us things that we need to do and uphold as good Catholics. Like, um, it promulgates us to good actions that help us adhere to our faith and grow deeper in love of Jesus and love of the church and spreading the gospel. But in this encyclical, and I want you to look it up, because it's a beautiful, it's easy to read, it's not in very hard language, it's from 1956, but it essentially says that there's two reasons the church gives the highest form of worship to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. The first is that the Sacred Heart is hypostatically united to the Word of God, which just means Jesus' human heart is real, it beaded, it still continues to beat in heaven, and it will always beat because Jesus is eternal. And when he took on flesh, he was still a divine person. So I want you to keep that in mind. We're going to talk about that more, about like what kind of worship we give to him. But the first thing is that it's God himself. So when we look at an image of the Sacred Heart, when we talk about the Sacred Heart, when we pray to the Sacred Heart, when we ask for um, mercy from the Sacred Heart, we are giving God his proper form of worship as God. The second thing Pope Pius XII said is, the heart is the natural sign and symbol for Jesus' boundless love for humanity. And that is something that we should all be praying with, contemplating, meditating upon, and asking for is God's merciful love as sinners. Like that should be our daily invocation. So um, if you can read that, you, all you have to do is Google it. It'll pop right up. The USCCB 
um, it'll it'll come right up. It'll show you. It'll bring you to Vatican VA or Vatican something, and um, the the document will come up. It's easy to read. It's beautiful, and it will definitely um, help you to continue. If I could add to that, yes, please. So. <clears throat> When we talk about the heart, right, when Jesus, uh, about his heart and about his humanity and his, and his heart and how the Pope here um, talks about and brings that together, um, Jesus was fully God and fully human, which means he felt like we feel. He feels emotions. And as we all experience emotions, we feel emotions in different parts of our body. We feel emotions in different, like usually when, you, when you're scared or you're sick, you'll feel it in your stomach, right? When you're anxious, you'll feel it kind of radiate throughout your limbs. Um, but when you're feeling loved, when you're feeling secure, when you're feeling safe, you feel it here. You feel that here. So that love radiates from his heart, but we can experience that ourselves when we feel love, when we're deeply in love and when we're feeling that. Now, love is not always a feeling, so don't quote me on that, but it just, it just kind of helps tie it in, right? So that's why, that's why the heart, and that's, that's kind of where that comes from. So just to give you a quick timeline, and then I'm going to get you to talk to us about the visions and revelations of Sister Margaret Mary. But So in 16, 1765, the devotion was first approved in Rome. And then in 1856, the feast was university, uh, universally claimed as a solemn day by Pope Pius IX. And then in 1899, Pope Leo the 13th composed an act of consecration that dedicated the entire race. So that means every human being ever made has been dedicated through our church to the sacred heart of Jesus, which when I read that, I was like, that's so profound because that means even the people who have heard about God and denied him, the people who have never heard about God and his mercy and his grace, the people who have yet to be born, the people who have already died, everyone has been consecrated to the sacred heart of Jesus. And that's something profound to pray about. Um, so I, I wanted to give you that history. And then in 1956, in Hariatus Aquas, which means you will draw waters, Pope Pius the 13th, I'm sorry, Pope Pius the 12th, made the encyclical to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the Feast of the Sacred Heart. So I just kind of wanted you to have a timeline. You can go back to the Church Fathers, like Deacon Jewel said, as early as Justin Martyr, where they refer to the heart of Jesus. So this is an ancient tradition. This isn't something that the Church just made up along the way. It's scripturally based, and it goes all the way back to the beginning. So we'll keep going now. Okay, Deacon, tell us about the visions and revelations of Sister Margaret Mary. So one of the things I love about certain saints like Sister Margaret Mary and St. Faustina is their mysticism and Christ actually appearing to them. Um, it's something that it's one of those gifts that I could kind of, it's like you, you want to ask for it, but then you're scared, right? In that same breath. How cool would it be for Christ to just pop up right here in front of us, right? And have a conversation. Um, so I really love reading about their encounters. And with Sister Margaret, Mary, um, Jesus appeared several times. And when he, when he did, his expression and, and his, his message to her was over sorrow for humanity and how they lacked the love and compassion and indifference for who he was as Christ. And they, they lacked um, love for even for humanity. Um, so the key themes that came out of these repetitive visions were around the need for reparation, right? For us as a race to repair ourselves, to bring ourselves back into communion with him and to ask for the forgiveness of our sins um, is really the looking for his mercy because at that time there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of misguided information focusing on Christ the judge, right? That, the, that was being promoted, that Christ was this really strict judge. And, you know, Jesus wanted us to know 
that his mercy, while yes, he is our just judge, his mercy is infinite. His mercy is endless. And he wants us to lean into his mercy and trusting in his mercy um, and look for reparation through those means. Um, a couple other big things was the establishment of the devotion for First Fridays, which we're going to talk about in a little bit more in depth, and also the establishment of the feast day. Um, and also the visions highlighted a deep connection between the Eucharist and his sacred heart. And we're also going to talk a little bit more about that um, in a little bit as we start to dive a little bit deeper in how the Eucharist is deeply tied into that of the sacred heart. I think it's amazing and important for us to remember that Jesus appeared to Sister Margaret Mary and asked for these specific things. Like he said, I want you to come to Mass on First Friday for nine consecutive months. I want you to adore me in the Eucharist. I want you to make a holy hour. I want you, like, holy hour isn't something Father Michael made up here, you know, just for our chapel. We know that it's tried and true that holy hours have been requested by Jesus, but made for for centuries and and that they're effective why because jesus provides he's the great provider um so i think it's important for us to remember jesus asked margaret mary for these specific things and to establish the feast day which is in june okay so how can we venerate the sacred heart of jesus so there's multiple ways uh, we're going to talk about six of them tonight the first way is the first friday devotions so uh, a novena, right? Uh, so nine consecutive prayers. Uh, Jesus actually asked for a novena to the first Friday. So any soul that, um, and we'll get to this in the promises, right? But one of them is the first Friday asking for us to attend mass and receive Holy Communion on the first Friday of every, of every month. That is actually one way of devotion. Um, but you can actually make that into a novena by doing it for nine consecutive months, and there's some indulgences that are attached to that as well. Another way is prayer. Um, there's numerous prayers dedicated to the Sacred Heart, one of which we, we said earlier, um, but we're going to actually go through one later tonight during adoration. We're going to do the litany of the Sacred Heart together. Um, that's something that you can do regularly on, on your own in your own private prayer. It is something that we here at Sacred Heart do once a month um, for our first Friday adoration at the conclusion. Another one is an act of consecration um, where you can personally consecrate and, and join yourself and your heart to that of the mission of the Sacred Heart. Uh, like Krista was saying, Eucharistic adoration, Eucharistic adoration. Um, spending time with Christ in the Eucharist. I love to say adoration to me, uh, the way I look at adoration is, um, it's my radiation therapy, <laughs> right? It's like we are all broken, hurt souls, right? We are all lost and on a journey. But when I enter that chapel or when I enter the church and I just sit and spend time in front of the Blessed Sacrament, whether he's exposed or he's within the tabernacle, he's present. And his love and his presence is radiating through that tabernacle. It's radiating through the air. And just his presence around us, that radiation, um, is definitely a way to venerate. Just spending time with him in, in silent prayer. Acts of reparation. Um, this is different things you can do for acts of reparation. Some of it is prayer. You can offer up specific prayers as acts of reparation for the sins of yourself. But one of the cool things that I really love about the Sacred Heart is you, you're really not only looking for reparation for yourself, but you're asking for reparation for all of the sins of the whole world, right? Um, so through offering up your own personal sacrifices or your penances, prayers, and even good works. So when you... Um, when you spend time serving the most needy in our community or when you spend time loving on a soul that is broken or walking with someone on a journey, you can actually offer up that work of mercy as an act of reparation, okay? And that is honoring and venerating the sacred heart even in an indirect way. Our prayers and our actions don't always have to be direct and explicit. But if within our heart, our intention is to do and perform a certain thing, it's that intention that matters the most, 
It's where our heart lies. And that includes fasting. Mm -hmm. That includes even doing the works. I used to tell young moms who were maybe struggling with all the laundry and all the (laughs) errands and all the things they had to do. And I said, but don't forget, when you're folding those clothes, like all you have to do is say, Jesus, this is my prayer to you. And it's an efficacious prayer. So don't waste anything. It could be the smallest the smallest act done with love, like yeah. St. Uh, Teresa said, small acts of kindness with great love. So I'll, I like to tell when I'm doing baptism prep, I tell the moms, especially the ones that aren't, hadn't quite had the baby yet. I'm like, listen, you're going to come to a point you're going to be wanting to pull your hair out. You just don't know how you're going to wash another bottle. I said, but every bottle you wash is a prayer to Jesus out of love for your child. And that's the greatest calling of any soul. So a couple other ways that we can... Um, venerate is through displaying the image of the sacred heart um there's many pictures and we're going to show a few of them tonight a little later that you can uh, display on your walls there's also statues of the sacred heart and it's even called a ceremony uh, enthronement ceremony where you can actually enthrone the sacred heart to your home Uh, we'll get to my story a little later but we actually did that several years back um, with the little statue, he's now on my. Uh, that statue is now on my nightstand, but we used to keep it on our mantle uh, in our living room. So the enthronement of the Sacred Heart is definitely one way that we can venerate it. And then lastly, there's the feast of the Sacred Heart itself, which is celebrated the 19th days after Pentecost. Thank so. you. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is um, the promises Jesus made to Sister Margaret Mary. Um, I think we have these up here for you. Okay. Awesome. So um, I'm one of those kind of people that I like to see. I'm a businessman by trade, right? So I like to see what my ROI is going to be, my return on my investment. And with the devotion to the uh, divine mercy, the devotion and uh, the devotion to the rosary and the devotion to the sacred heart, what's really cool is there are some listed returns on your investment to these devotions. And those are the promises that come along with these devotions. Um, With the sacred heart of Jesus, there's 12 of them. Um, The first one is I will give them all the graces necessary for their state of life. So by being devoted to the sacred heart, Jesus promises that he will give us the graces, he will give us the blessings, he will give us the things that we need. Doesn't mean he's going to make everything perfect, but he's going to give us the strength we need to soldier through our state of life. What's our state of life? Well, priests, right? The uh, holy orders is a state of life. Um, Married couples in that covenant, that is a state of life. Maybe you're single or religious. That's your state of life. So wherever you are by being devoted to the sacred heart, he promises to walk with you and to give you the graces that you need to hold on to that state and to be successful there. Um, he also promises to be to establish peace in their homes. This is definitely one um, families who venerate the sacred heart will experience greater peace rooted in the love and mercy of Christ. This is one that I've seen personally for myself. Once we took on the devotion, we did the enthronement at home, uh, and we pray for the Sacred Heart, the mercy of the Sacred Heart um, every night. Life is still chaotic. I've got five kids, right? Um, We still deal with the drama, but there's a sense and an air of peace within our family. Um, That's definitely there. The third promise is, I will comfort them in their afflictions. Notice it doesn't say, I will take away and prevent their afflictions. It doesn't mean that we will be without pain, but it means that Christ is going to be with us every step of the way, giving us some consolation within our soul. One thing we can do as part of the devotion is when we are suffering, is offer that suffering up and uh, align it with the devotion to the Sacred Heart. That'll just kind of exponentially move things along. He will secure refuge during life and above all in death. So Jesus will give us a safe place to lean into during our life, whatever we're struggling with. But the part that really, really kind of grips me is that death, right? Um, 
that knowing that my devotion to the Sacred Heart and our devotion to the Sacred Heart can help us to know that we're going to be protected as we transition from this life into the next. He would pour abundant blessings on all of our undertakings. So again, it doesn't mean we're going to be rich and famous. It doesn't mean that all of our troubles are going to go away. But he's going to bless the things that we do, especially if those things are leaning into the mercies of his sacred heart. The next three of these, I like to say, are compounding interest, right? The sinner who converts to the sacred, who converts and goes towards the sacred heart will find an ocean of infinite mercy. So that sinner can find that mercy and find that peace, find that way to release. Well, now that new, re, that new freely released soul is going to start walking towards Christ. Well, then they'll become fervent, right? Well, as they're growing, I'm sorry, they'll become lukewarm. Yeah, yeah, they'll become lukewarm. So you go from the sinning state to the lukewarm state. Now that you're lukewarm, the more you fall into the mercy, the more he'll pour into you. Those lukewarm souls then grow. That flame kind of builds up within you. And then they become fervent. And then the fervent soul will quickly, I like how it reads, right? Will quickly aim to mount to high perfection. And you see how they play into themselves and they escalate. So I really like that crescendo there. Next, I will bless every place where a picture of my sacred heart shall be exposed and honored. You know, that picture or that statue, they, they work the same. It's just that imagery, right? We place, we place crucifixes, we place other images around us, not to worship the image, but for that image to help remind us and to keep us connected to the message behind that image, right? So when we put up the statue of Jesus, maybe on our mantle or somewhere prominently in our house, we're not saying that statue is Jesus. We're saying that that statue reminds us, reminds us of who the person Jesus is and gives us a model to look towards. So uh, next, I will give priests the power to touch the most hardened hearts. Our priests need our prayers, right? We'll even notice the closer we get, the, the, the harder we fight, and the closer that we get to salvation, the harder the devil's going to push. Think about our priests. They really need our prayers because their jobs are to, to save souls, right? Those demons are constantly on them. So very, very reassuring for our priests to know that uh, Jesus is there to help them touch the hardened hearts. And those who shall promote the devotion shall have their names written in my heart. Ooh. So not only should we adopt the devotion for ourselves, if we want to take it another step, want to add an extra deposit, let's promote the devotion. Let's promote that devotion. Okay. I think we're... Is that it? I think, yeah, the last one. Oh, the last one is about his mercy coming to us and our refuge in our last hour. So at that moment of death, if we've been devoted, he promises to be there as our refuge and safeguard in our last hours. So that kind of goes back and ties into another one, but it does work. Thank you. Okay, describe the different mysteries and visual realities in the images of the sacred heart of Jesus. All right, so... I think we have another... Don't we have another slide? Yeah, this one. There we go. Um, so there's a lot of different depictions of the sacred heart. And we're going to look at a few of them after this. Yes. The flames represent his burning love for humanity. Christ loves us with all he has, and he constant, his love has always been there for us before it was with us when he was suffering and died and it is with us today and will be with us for eternity and that 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 flame represents that burning desire the crown of thorns surrounding the heart symbolizes the pain and suffering that he endured 
and endures for our sins. The cross helps and that is seen above represents his sacrifice on the cross and his willingness to die for us. The wound and the blood, the pierced heart reminds us of the lance that wounded his side and the blood signifies his sacrifice for the forgiveness of sins. So when we look at these, when we look at an image of the sacred heart, we can pray thinking of the whole image. We can pray thinking about an element of the image. We can pray about components of it together. Um, it really helps us to think about different portions of Christ and how complex he really is. Someone told me recently that um, we could pray with a wound on the side of Christ and entering that wound, which the spear went up through that wound and pierced his heart, and that's where the fount of mercy came, right? That's where all the blood and the water spilled, and that's where his mercy poured out. And to, to meditate on that wound mm -hmm. and how the wound wasn't just physical, but it was spiritual. Like you said earlier, Jesus felt with a human heart, but he also felt with a divine heart, and he continues to be pierced, and he continues to hurt in his heart for humanity when we turn away. And so that's why this continual reparation and request for reparation um, for souls. Um, the other thing I heard recently was when we're meditating on that type of wound, when we're meditating on his mercy, we should really be praying for the souls who are most near death, who have no one to pray for them, or, and who are in most need of our mercy. And so talk about an offering and an act of reparation. And just when I think about praying, I try to think of us in our baptismal consecration, right? We're baptized as prophet, king, and priest. And as priests, um, we're not ministerial priests, but we are, we are priests in the sense that we're, we're part of the kingdom, um, and we're made to worship. And so when we, when we pray and honor and worship the, the sacred heart as God himself, right? We, don't, we know that there are different kinds of worship and prayer and reverence and veneration. We, we give to God alone what God alone deserves, and that includes his sacred heart because it's truly him. It's truly God. And um, but when we when we do that, we're we're actualizing our consecration of our baptismal um, gifts of being priest because we're giving honor, we're giving sacrifice, we're giving worship properly. And then as prophets, when we share this type of good news, when we when we invite people to pray with us, when we pray for others who are suffering, we're we're being the prophets. We're we're spreading the good news. And then of course as kings. Um, kings provide for their subjects. And so, again, in that kingly office, when we pray for those who are part of our community, we're, we are fulfilling that. So this is just one more way through this devotion that we actualize our baptismal call and we actually grow in holiness, not because of what we do, but because of God's mercy and that communion with him, that being with him. So um, I thought I'd share that because it touched me so deeply when I heard it. Okay, so if I decide to take, let's say I, I hear this talk, Deacon Jules, and I say, ooh, I think I want to, I think I want to consider being part of this devotion to the Sacred Heart. Do I have to do all the things, or can I just do some of the things, or what things should I do? Like, if I just want to tiptoe in, what do I do? No, it's all or nothing. No, <laughs> I'm joking. I'm joking. Um, one of the beautiful things about a devotion, right, it's a private thing. And it's a, it can be public when we, when we participate in the public functions or the public uh, things that are, that are offered, but it's private. And it can simply, it, it can be as simple as sacred heart of Jesus, I trust in you. Uh, have mercy on me. Sacred heart of Jesus, have mercy on me, right? It can be as simple as that. And that's your devotion. Every morning you wake up, sacred heart of Jesus. Have mercy on me. It can be as deep as you want it to be. You can pick up every piece of this and you can run full, full force with it. Um, the best advice is to discern and to see where God is calling you to. 
to, you know, how deep, how deep do you want to go? Um, sometimes it's peel back that first layer of the onion and see how much it unfolds for you. Um, there is something that we did um, that we kind of skipped over that I'd like to go back to. Absolutely. Um, when we were talking about Jesus and how he, when he was um, presenting this to Sister Margaret Mary, and he was aligning this with the Eucharist, and where we get Eucharistic adoration. Um, there's been many times in our human history, especially as of recent few years, as science has developed, that um, the Eucharist l comes alive. Now, we believe in the full transfiguration at the consecration, that at the prayers of consecration, the uh, piece of bread becomes the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ. Okay? In and of itself. There's been times where it becomes so physical that it takes on actual human flesh. And there's been even instances where this human flesh bleeds. And science, because we are advanced as we are in our society nowadays, in our technology, has been able to study, with the permission of the Vatican, some of these Eucharistic miracles. And we call them miracles, because indeed they are. And pretty much every time they're studied, something very interesting comes out of it. The tissue in this Eucharist that they study and they put under a microscope and they figure out what it is, not only is it human, not only is it flesh, but it's a human heart tissue. And it's alive. And it's alive. <laughs> like it's not dead decomposing. Correct. It's alive tissue. Okay. And I, yes, I'm, I'm pulling up my phone because I did, um, I wanted to make sure I wasn't lying on y'all. So misspeaking, I, misspeaking, misspeaking, misspeaking. You would never lie. No, not, not intentionally. Um, I consulted chat GPT for my quick research today. Um, but one such instance was in 1971, a team of scientists looked and the tissue was the human heart muscle specific. I'm not going to pronounce that. I'm going to mispronounce it. The blood type was AB, which is the same blood type found in the Shroud of Turin and is common in the Middle Eastern population. Now, this happened in Italy in the 8th Century was when this one happened, okay? Despite being centuries old, when the tissue of the blood was sampled, it showed no signs of decay. Again, in Argentina, 1996, a host turned to flesh. The scientist was a former atheist. And after his studying and realizing the components of what he was studying converted because there was no logical explanation for what he discovered. And again in 2008, a host turned into flesh after being dropped during mass. The sample was heart muscle tissue. This one was in Poland. So these are just three examples of the many that exist. And there are some that every year, I believe it is, every year they go from congealed blood to liquid blood mm -hmm. within, the, within the monstrance that, they, that they're held. Um, so the fact that when Christ allows himself to be manifest 
in a tangible form that we can recognize beyond that of the mystery of the Eucharist, because we have to admit it's a mystery to us, right? That each time that this happens, when we study it through science, it all comes back to the same thing. His sacred heart. His sacred heart. Thank you so much for sharing that. We hadn't talked about that, so that's a treat. Um, Okay, what I want to do now is bring up the images of the Sacred Heart real quick, and then we're going to, Deacon Jules is going to share a story with us. There are so many.